Okay, I'm Mike Gridley, editor of The Messenger, and I'm here with Bill Furbush, who's the American Legion commander here in Baldwinsville, and also a Korean War vet, and he's going to share with us some of his memories of uh, his service and, and uh, what he remembers about that time. Bill, how did you get uh, started in the service? Well, I was drafted in, in uh, the spring after the war began. That would be the spring of 51. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you remember, like, basically what was going on at that time? You, you, you know well, a little bit about the war. Well, yes, uh, of course, in June, of the war began in June of 1950. Mm -hmm. And the North Koreans swooped down on South Korea, and they pushed the South Koreans all the way down to Pusan. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, the American troops who were stationed in Japan got over there to help, but they were, they were they had, North Koreans had just too much momentum. Mm -hmm. But they did stop them at the Pusan perimeter, and then they pushed them all the way back up, of course, way past the 30th parallel, almost to the Chinese border, which mm -hmm. was when MacArthur wanted to go over mm -hmm. and invade China, because the Chinese were coming over then, mm -hmm. and that's when MacArthur got the axe. Right. And then they then then they they were pushed back to what t what time frame are we here now? It was this was the winter of that that was one of the terrible things about that uh, Chinese and North Korean attack was right in the dead of winter and American mm -hmm. troops were really not supplied for that even though they they did the best they could mm -hmm. thousands died there mm -hmm. but they th that time they pushed them down to south of Seoul. Uh, 30th parallel, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, as I remember, there was a town called Pyeongtaek, which later I was stationed there as an MP for a short while. And that's about where they stopped them. Mm -hmm. And then by that time, American troops were coming over in great numbers because mm -hmm. the draft had taken place, and there were a lot of soldiers coming in, this is and they pushed them. What what year is this now? About this this is still 51. Okay. Well, the winter was the big. Uh, pushed down, mm -hmm. and then by 51 they had regrouped and were able to hold them. Right. And so uh, they were, they may have gotten as far as Taejeon. I remember, I remember when we came into Taejeon, see, I, I was not in combat much, I was an MP, but we were right behind the lines. And the, mm -hmm. in Taejeon, I remember looking across the, the city of Taejeon, and about all you could see standing were bank vaults. Every, everything else was destroyed, flattened right down. Really? And there were several Russian tanks that, that had been of course, the Russians and the North Koreans were operating them, but they were abandoned there. And mm -hmm. uh, by that time, uh, as I say, the, uh, uh, the, the United Nations forces were pretty much on the offensive. Mm -hmm. And they stopped them. And then, of course, the, uh, the, uh, well, the main line of resistance was more or less stabilized. It ran from northern, north of the 30th parallel on the east to just south of the 30th parallel on the west. Mm -hmm. Koreans lost one one city of any size. It was called Kaesong, I think it was. Mm -hmm. We can look it up in the map. And all, all the other cities in South Korea were, of course, liberated. Mm -hmm. And they were mostly farming villages anyway, north of the 30th parallel on the east coast. Now, what was North Korea like compared to South Korea as far as... Oh, well, North the, the, well, North Korea, of course, was always the, the mountainous part of Korea. Mm -hmm. The south, southern part provided almost all the food for Korea. Mm -hmm. And the North had mines, or, uh, uh, quite a few coal and, and mineral mines. And that's why it was valuable to the South, because it was, it was a, a very well-balanced country. The mm -hmm. minerals and so forth came from the North, and the food came from the South. Mm -hmm. And that's why the North Koreans never did get very far, because they had no food yeah. to speak of in, in great amounts. Right. And the South didn't have any resources as far as coal, and or very little, mm -hmm. coal and iron and so forth. The northern part is, of Korea is very picturesque, very beautiful mountains, mm -hmm. but not very practical for, for farming. farming and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. So now, how did how did it wind up? That well, then the then then this this the main line of resistance, as I said, it ran from uh, in the north, north in the east side, from north to south, a kind of jagged line, which it is today even. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the uh, what do they call it? The uh, mil demilitarized zone mm -hmm. was established. I think it was about 20 miles wide. And uh, of course, Pen and John talks went on. So if they still were, I suppose they're still going on. Although the, I'm not sure the follow-up whether the, they ever did declare 
piece or not, but mm -hmm. it's... Uh, it's kind of held in that... Yeah, but it held there, yeah. And, and there were some violations, of course, you probably read about, where mm -hmm. North Koreans would occasionally make a sortie over. In fact, they found a tunnel that they had dug, hoping to invade the South. Mm -hmm. But it was discovered before they could pull it off. Yeah. They were very, uh, very militaristic, the North Koreans. They had mm -hmm. nothing up there, and they wanted, they wanted the South bad. And of course, up until the fall of communism, I suppose they were supplied fairly well by China and Russia with weapons. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, but the country itself, you've probably read about the Kim Il-sung sect. I mean, everybody thought he was the greatest thing that ever lived. Mm -hmm. He was a godfather, of a, a image of God and father image of South or North Koreans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So get, getting back to you personally, how, how did your service run over? Well, you see, before I, uh, when I was drafted at the time, I was a deputy sheriff in Los Angeles County. Mm -hmm. And when I went in, I had been in the service before, so I didn't have to go through basic training right away. They gave me uh, the military police MOS because of my civilian work. Mm -hmm. MOS is, I think they call it military occupational, uh, I forgot, status or something like that. Mm -hmm. S specialty specialty okay. military occupational specialty and so that's I was I got that right from the day I was uh, I was drafted mm -hmm. so when we got to Korea I was we came in at Incheon not the of course the famous invasion of Incheon took place uh, that's early, way early that spring or maybe even the winter before when MacArthur came in there and caught them from behind mm -hmm. the North Koreans but anyway we came in at Incheon and I was sent to Taejeon where I was assigned to a military military police battalion. Mm -hmm. And our work mostly there was uh, patrolling the uh, MSR, they call it uh, military supply route, mm -hmm. which was very important because everything had to be trucked there, trains and so forth were all non-existent. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that was our main job. And then later on, we were assigned to refugee, con refugee control posts which the, when the Koreans were pushed down, the civilians, they wanted to go back. And of course, the previous operations I was ta talking about, the uh, civilian, the refugees were in the way of the military. And they, mm -hmm. so this time they said they're not going to let them go up until they were pushed back and things stabilized. But they kept wanting to come up because their farms were there. They wanted to go back. Mm -hmm. So we had to we we had checkpoints on all the main highways, turning back refugees. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was part of our duty, that and, and as I say, policing the MSR for such things, speeding and so forth. Yeah. And also one of the main uh, jobs of military police was to, uh, was to control, in, in case of deserters, we had to watch always for anybody who was not authorized to be in, behind the lines. Mm -hmm. They were, of course, detained and mm -hmm. had to be cleared. Right. And there were not only American GIs, but of course that was a UN operation, so we even had Turks and Ethiopians and of course a lot of British and Colombians. We had many, many countries mm -hmm. were fighting there. It was very interesting in that respect, because yeah. we were on the lines, we watched them all go up and back, we could see them all. Some very interesting people. Yeah. But uh, so most of my, as I say, that was our main duty, patrolling the MSR, military supply routes. And of course, we had some traffic things. For example, when a road was destroyed, we had to run a defile so the traffic go through single file and stop them, as they do in construction and so forth. Right. And there were all kinds of jobs and black market operations too. We were uh, in charge of. We had to raid the black markets because a lot of GIs were selling cigarettes and stuff there. And, yeah. and Koreans, of course, wanted military script. Their money wasn't worth much going up in inflation, mm -hmm. so anything they could sell, it was it was the in a way it was the coin of of of, Japan, of Korea then to be able to get a hold of military script and they could always trade it for yen or won. They call won their money, uh -huh. and uh, that was another one of our operations. And of course, we had to enforce uh, in the cities. We had to enforce the curfew hours after mm -hmm. a certain time. They all had to be back to their bases. And uh, what else? Well, that was mainly it. There were there were districts, of course, that were off limits, yeah. noted uh, areas of prostitution and so forth. Right. What was the makeup of your unit? Were they mostly former law enforcement? No, people no, or? no, no. In fact, uh, there were only a, f a few of us. Uh, they were mostly GIs. This was called the 519th M Military Police Battalion. They were stationed in Japan. Mm 
That's one reason that they were uh, over there so soon. They came over right after the first invasion. And they went way up to the north with them, just behind the lines, of course. Yeah. And uh, and then they were pushed back, and I joined them, as I say, in Tejan at that time. How, how many men were in there? Well, it was a battalion. And if I remember rightly, we had four operational, uh, let's see, ABC company headquarters, four uh, companies. So we had three, a company would be, if I remember right, about roughly 200, 250 men. But we were on round the clock shifts, of course, we had to go out and right. had to be manned all the time. So it was, uh, it was interesting work. And we were, uh, toward the end, we were up in the, as I say, north of the 30th parallel on the east coast, and we weren't too far behind the lines. We could hear the guns all the time. And occasionally we'd have to shuffle or shuttle pr uh, prisoners of war that they were captured back to the, to the rear. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it wasn't too far from there, but we were not in danger as, of course, the guys in the lines were. Yeah. There were uh, yeah, a lot of instances, so I remember one, uh, one particular place I was at that they had a big push up on the line and poor Korean wounded were brought back in those big six by trucks. I mean, many of our soldiers were flown out or taken out in ambulances we see on MASH, you know. Yeah. But these guys, they were just, they couldn't keep up with it. And I remember seeing load after load of these poor Koreans moaning in the back of the truck. I felt so sorry for them because there was, there was just no, no facilities for them. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of that. And as I say, they, there was a, there was a lot of work there. They, they would catch occasionally infiltrators from the north because they were all Koreans. They spoke, and they would uh, try to come down through places in the line that were not guarded to try to get into the south mm -hmm. as spies and so forth. But I remember we catch there were, there were several of them were caught mm -hmm. in that line. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did, now, was the language a problem for you since you had to deal with so many different? Well, people? no. We always we always had a. Uh, there were three, two types of policemen, there were national policemen who were worked for the Korean government, uh, civilian, I guess you'd say civilian government, and then there were the Korean MPs mm -hmm. and an interpreter. We always had, usually any of our groups had at least two of those, always an interpreter and maybe a, a national policeman or a military policeman with us. So there was always somebody that could oh, know, yeah. speak oh, yeah. the language. Oh, yeah. It and was, uh, yeah, otherwise there was no, because the Koreans knew almost no English except those during that period when after the Japanese left and the Koreans took over their own government. Then of course they went mad into English as much as they could but they were very limited. They had no teachers because the Japanese didn't want the Koreans to learn English while they were in occupied Korea. Mm -hmm. So there was a five year period, about five years. And they were studying English like crazy but <laughs> it wasn't quite enough. No, to... <laughs> well we, we got by. We got yeah. by. Some were better than others. Yeah. I had a, a very interesting story about that, though. I, after, just toward the end, when I was in Japan, I was able to go over to uh, Korea for a visit, I, just you know, a vacation. It was just before the Seoul Olympics, and there's this, there was this interpreter in my outfit when I was an MP there, who we became rather good friends because he was one of those who spoke English pretty well. And I had his addre he, uh, address from way back, and he had mine. He knew I lived in Baldwinsville, although I wasn't living here but I was the address when my mother was here and she, he could always send a letter there. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along about, I'd, I think it must have been during the 70s, I got a, my mother said she got a postcard from this guy in Korea asking if she knew anything about me and she, of course she sent it to me. Mm -hmm. He was at that time at the East West Center in Hawaii. He became, went on with his English studies. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote to him and on his way back he stopped to see me in Kyoto where I was living. And so I had his address up to about 15 years ago. When I went to Korea this time, rather recently, mm -hmm. I, uh, just for the heck of it, I had the address, but I had no idea of how current it was or anything about it. So I went to a, a tourist office near the hotel where I was staying, and I asked, do you suppose there's anywhere in the world I could find this person? I told him a story. And he said, wow, he said, that's a pretty common name here. Not as common as Kim. Kim is the most common name in Korea. Mm -hmm. So he, he said, well, I'll see what I can do. So I went out on a tour that afternoon, I came back, and I was in my hotel room, and there was a knock on the door. It was the guy, he had located him. He said, the first one I tried was him. He was, at that time, the head of the English department at the largest women's university in the world. 
Hmm. I can't, Air Fly, I think the name of it was. But uh, it's a big mission school, but it, all women uh, school, and he was the head mm -hmm. of the department there. Very successful. He's probably retired now. But we had a great time together, and since then I went back again to see him. He mm -hmm. it was very interesting that we were able to locate him because Seoul by now is a huge city. Yeah. Huge city. That's really amazing. It really is. But to be able to find him like that, and everybody was amazed about it, he was very yeah. happy to see me again, and I was happy to see him. Yeah. And I was traveling with a Japanese friend who was also very much interested in, uh, in, in well, in Korea, in fact, he was just my age, and he was about to, just before the war was over, he was about to be sent to Seoul to go to the, the Imperial University there and run by the Japanese. But, of course, the war stopped that. So he had been studying a little Korean, and he knew all the things. And they, they had a great, these, this, these two guys, because this, uh, this friend, the interpreter, he had... Uh, <coughs> He has learned, learned Japanese, of course, he had learned Japanese. Mm -hmm. And he, he learned Japanese at that time in words that uh, they, they're not used in Japan anymore because they're rather, rather old fashioned, you know. Mm -hmm. And these guys had a great kick talking about those things, you know. It was very yeah. interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. so now, how, did you, how long were you over there and then what, ha what happened? Well, I was there from, uh, I think I arrived, it was the spring of uh, 51, and I stayed until. The, just before Christmas of uh, 52. Yeah, I was uh, I was able to come home a little earlier on points, but I, I extended for three more months because I didn't want to face three months of stateside duty. Yeah. That to me would, would be hell. I'd rather been in Korea. Yeah. And I, by that time I was getting used to it, and I said I had a lot of Korean friends, and yeah. I had I think I enjoyed it much more than most guys did. <laughs> yeah. Especially not being on the, on the line. Yeah. Now after you went back, went to school, and then. Ended up going back to yeah, that's right to Japan. Mm -hmm. I went. I came back. Uh, uh, well, I, I went out in the spring of '52. The end of '52, I said it must have been. I'm thinking. I know I went in '51. I came back just before Christmas, '52. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was '53, and then I, I went there and I went back to my job in the sheriff's department and uh, the GI Bill. I graduated from UCLA, mm -hmm. and while I was in college, I met a. A Japanese fellow who was a Buddhist priest, and he was over studying. He was born in America, as a matter of fact, but then went back and all, all during the war, he was in Japan. But they sent him back to America, and he was able to go back and get me a job at a, a Buddhist university there in Kyoto, mm -hmm. where I taught the first eight years. And you were there right up until the ninety-one few years ago, yeah. Yeah. Then I got a job in the National University, so. You had family back here in Ballinsville, your mother? My mother, my, well, she died while I was over there, my father too. But my brother's been here all the time, you know. Right. Yeah. Right, now, but, but you originally were in Los Angeles, you were saying before? Yeah, well, that's where I, I uh, well, I'll go back. From 48, from 48 to 50, I was in the Army, peacetime Army. Okay. And I was discharged at Fort Lewis, Washington. And I was going to go back home, come back home here to New York, and I said, well, I've never been to California, so I dropped down there. Well, I got down there, and I got to know some people, and I stayed. <laughs> <laughs> and then get called back in? Yeah. And then, then while I was out there, I got drafted. Well, it was not too long after that. I arrived there in California the spring of 50, I guess it was, and it was the spring of 51 when I was drafted. But in the meantime, I'd passed the civil service exam and got in the sheriff's department. Hmm. The first time you were in the army, though, you weren't peace doing anything like that. No, well, that was peacetime. Of course, I was. Uh, well, I was sent to uh, Fort Dix, where everybody puts in their basic training from around here, and then Fort Sam Houston for X-ray technician training, and then back to Fort Totten, New York, and then out to Fort Lewis, Washington. Yeah, <laughs> it was a good, good yeah. experience. Twenty-one months both times. So altogether, I had three and a half years of military experience. Mm -hmm. Twenty-one months both times. Mm -hmm. Now, what was it like spending all that time in Japan? Did you get did you get back here at all? Oh yeah, well, I, it took me five years to save enough to come home the first time on, on, a, on a freighter. <laughs> <laughs> but after that, things got better, and I was able to fly. Then about every year, and toward the end, it was almost every year. Well, of course, the economy helped a lot. Mm -hmm. the economy. When I went to Japan in '57, not only was it only 360 yen to a dollar, but the pay was so low. I mean, it was unbelievable in Japan. Uh, I suppose, well, I was, I got 20,000 yen a month, but it, no, 20,000 yen 16 times a year, I had a funny pay system at that time. 
Mm -hmm. But anyway, it was. Uh, it took a long time to, to save enough to even yeah. come home by freighter. <laughs> right. <laughs> are there are there things about that part of the world that you know that people over here don't aren't aware of? I'm sure there are. But well, uh, things have changed a lot. When in '57, see, '57 was only uh, well, let's say about. 12 years after the war mm -hmm. and Japan was still they were still on their knees it was still pretty rough there the economy mm -hmm. but soon after that of course getting back to the Korean War the Korean War helped the Japanese economy a great deal mm -hmm. because we the Koreans produced a lot of the products they had to use in the war effort the transportation and all oh, and of course a place for their hospitals and and uh, staging grounds before they went to Korea the ports mm -hmm. and all so it really helped the Japanese economy to a great deal at that time mm -hmm. and then of course the, the big uh, the big boost to Japan I don't know how it worked exactly but I know it was just about the time of the oil crunch you know the, well Nixon was president mm -hmm. that was the first time the dollar jogged from 360 down to something like 330 we thought we we couldn't believe it because we thought it was going to be that way forever yeah and now it's less than a hundred yen to a dollar yeah you can imagine what that means it means <laughs> it means any tourist who goes to Japan better take a lot of money with him. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it's not going to go very far. Yeah. But as far as working over there, was it, was it, you able to make a good oh, living? Oh, well that's, then, then of course when all this began, then the raises started coming when I went to the National University from the private university, right away there's a big raise and I got bonuses and they provided me with housing. Oh, it was much, much better for me. Yeah. And but even now it's unbelievable that if, if you translate what some of those teachers are I mean what I was making when I left into dollars it make many of the teachers here turn green with envy because yeah. if you by the time but we couldn't we didn't feel that rich because by the time we b paid the Japanese inflated prices for things yeah it didn't go awfully far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but that's why when Japanese come here now mm -hmm. they're in heaven because their money goes so far. Yeah. It was just the exact reverse. When I first was 57, very few Japanese could ever aspire to get to visit a foreign country because mm -hmm. their money went so, didn't go very far at all. And now it's just the reverse. Yeah. They, they can travel and spend and they still think, why, well, I can't believe it, how cheap things are. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. It is. <laughs> well, it sounds like you had quite an experience well, over there. Looking back over it, I suppose it's, it's been fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I really, uh, I got to know the Japanese quite well, and it's, for, it's too bad that uh, we had the Second World War because they are good people, I think. Yeah. Well, they're, I mean, they, you can't speak for a whole race like that, but I mean, by and large, they always mm -hmm. treated me, foreigners in general, very well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wish they could get to know the Japanese better. Yeah. But a lot of a lot of people, especially in small towns like this, we still. There's many veterans who still have the war experience in their mind, and they, it's very hard, I suppose, to yeah. to forget and forgive, huh? Yeah. Okay, Bob, we'll wrap it up.